this man, this bearded man, 30 year old, and when he's 16, 17, bouncing about behind this counter and his records and shouting at us going, you know, you should listen to this and you should buy this here, this is brilliant, this is punk rock, this is great, and here you should get a guitar in your hand and I'd sort of, I'd, I'd, I'd put you on record if you get a band together and things like that there, and that started punk rock for me, and that started a life for me. December 1948. I was born in 11 Cameron Street in Belfast and there were three stars in the heavens above the house the night that I was born. If you believe that, you'll believe anything. Standing outside what used to be Sammy Houston's Jazz Club. Uh, there was 80 clubs in and around Belfast at the time that I was growing up in the 60s and bands used to go out and play uh, at the weekend three gigs, three different clubs on a Friday and Saturday night. But this is my favorite club. Uh, the most famous club in Belfast is probably the Maritime Hotel, which was around the corner there, where uh, them and uh, Rory Gallagher and Taste had all started. Right. But I was bored from the Maritime Hotel by my next door neighbor, Eddie Kennedy, for making political speeches against the, Viet the war in Vietnam. It was around about that sort of time that I uh, came across Terry Hooley. And um, in fact, I remember very clearly, Terry Hooley used to have uh, a folk club uh, in the Dublin Road, in this little house off the Dublin Road. And we'd go up there on a Friday night, I think it probably was, and get, get, get drunk and get stoned and listen to uh, um, subversive music, which at that time was folk music. In the seventies, we didn't go out very much because uh, of all the murder gangs and I mean a club bar had been bombed and all sorts of things were happening. And one night I came out of Kodak and we worked in Corporation Square, and these three gunmen jumped out of a car and tried to grab me in a car, and uh, it's a long story, but I got away. And uh, after that, I thought, well, I've always wanted, I've always been involved with records, I've always loved records from an early age. In fact, I used to think of music was the only thing that I had to keep me sane. Uh, I just decided, to, I'd read an exchange in Mart, a thousand singles for £40, so I sent away for them. And I started selling singles from the back bedroom, and then I sent away for albums and just started to build up the business and started to sell records. and. Belfast and Bellamina Market. I was a drummer in Protex, which was one of Terry's acts. I think we were got six in the first batch of singles that he brought out. And uh, we met Terry uh, when Good Vibrations first opened in Great Victoria Street. And it was the kind of first shop that really stocked all the punk stuff. Although the first thing I bought off him was an old doo wop single by the Castells, I think called Shinny Up Your Own Side or something. So he'd rave about doo wop and Ronnie Spector and all this kind of stuff. But then he really liked the, the new punk stuff that was coming out, which he felt was very similar to, to that period. So. I remember buying a Ramones record off him and after that you'd just go in and meet other people that were starting groups and things like that and Terry became central to that whole period. I opened up a record shop in Great Victoria Street with Dave Hyman um, who said uh, who had been involved with uh, trying to set up the Belfast Arts Lab 
and uh, Dave who had was running the community print press was looking for, looking for a change of premises so he had found these premises at 102 Great Victoria Street and Sassafras whole food shop was in Donegal and they were set up so uh, Dave took the top floor for the printing Sassafras had the ground floor and I took the middle floor for the record shop we released our first record and then really released big time on uh, on Good Vibrations and that was the first time I'd ever heard the name Good Vibrations so me and Getty went down to the to the record shop one day and met Terry and asked him to, to come along and see us play and he absolutely hated us but we sort of bonded, you know. Terry was like a big giant, giant schoolboy, full full of energy. And we hadn't, we, we hadn't met anybody then who had energy and was prepared to actually, to actually do something. So he then offered us. Terry never like offered you a deal. There was never any any money talked about or anything. He just said, "I'll bring out your next, your next record," and that's it. At night time, nobody used Belfast City Centre except the police and the army. Belfast City Centre was the only. A uh, city in Europe where the people of the country did not go into their main city at night. People went to, went to Bangor because it was a sort of a non sectarian place, you know, Catholic, Protestant, was, you, you could actually mix there, nobody really cared. Whereas everybody else hung about the, the, their own wee, wee area, went to the sort of social club or the, or, the, or the bars in their wee spot. Nobody actually sort of met each other then. It was really music that uh, was the link between Terry and I. We were both, you know, pretty interested in music, uh, along with a lot of other people. And he, of course, with his DJ, he then got his music shop. His music shop then became the center of uh, activity. And eventually then punk music began to develop in Belfast. But Jim Cusack said in the Irish Times that uh, it was Terry Hooley and the punks opened up the night uh, uh, center of Belfast. Before, it was used to be, um, the police and army, and that was the police and the army of punks, and they were the ones to open up the Belfast city centre. I don't think I could take credit for that. The whole city centre kind of shut down at night, so there was nothing happening at all. And Terry started to mention this place called the Heart Bar, which was in Skipper Street. And I'd never been there, didn't know where it was. It turned out it was kind of really down by the dogs virtually, and kind of quite a seedy place, but very welcoming to punk groups. It was the only place that would put groups on. So um, we tried playing in other venues and they tended to be banned or stopped or, you know, just didn't work out. So the harp became the regular venue to go and see groups and if you're in a group yourself to, to get a gig. I remember when John Peel first came over, uh, he wrote about us uh, in signs and he said he couldn't believe when he came into our office that in this dinky toy telephone booth we couldn't swing a cat all these fantastic records were coming out of. And he said he, uh, he was in with Mike Hawks and Kid Jensen. And uh, Kid, Mike Hawks was Kid Jensen's producer out of, out of Radio 1. And he said they were made a cold cup of coffee by Getty out of the outcasts. I think Getty had forgotten to turn the kettle on uh, in excitement. And, but they drank it because he looked so fierce. <laughs> and Getty out of the outcasts, one of the most gentle people you could ever meet in your life.
Terry hadn't have, hadn't have, hadn't have been there. There wasn't anybody else. You, you, you remember, nobody was interested, you know. No, no major label was inter interested in Belfast, and anybody in the in the entertainment scene scene here were into show bands or traditional music and stuff like we were just a nuisance. It, if, if Terry hadn't have, hadn't have been there, there wouldn't have been a punk scene. There'd just been a whole lot of little little bands playing to their own friends, and that's it. Oh, I loved the Outcasts. I mean, when I first heard them in the pound, it didn't rate them at all. I remember the night that the the Battle of the Bands at Queen's University, that uh, the Outcasts had a big round. We we're going to kill each other because the one that suggested doing a, a Gary Glitter number said, "No, we're a punk band." But I loved their music, and it was the first time in thirty years that kids could come together. And it didn't matter whether you're Protestant or Catholic. It didn't matter if you're from Mars. It didn't matter if you're green or orange or blue or pink. As long as you're a punk, that was the uniting force. Not for every so-called punk, but for a lot of kids, it really was the thing that changed their lives. Uh, a big moment for Terry was the, the Battle of the Bands down in the art college uh, in the early 70s. He had... Uh, a lot of bands, he had Roof Rex, he had Protex, he had the Outcasts, and uh, this was what he liked. It was a battle of the bands, here were the bands trying to win over the punters, and it was a very, very good night. It was a brilliant night for Terry. Jack's wearing his wig, sits in his high chair, and to my sympathy, there's silence, he will say, well, who the hell does he think he is kidding? This used to be a clothing warehouse, both sides, and, uh, which had been owned by a guy, Davy Smith's uh, father-in-law. Uh, Davy and his wife were in a band, and uh, he set up a studio in here. He set up a studio, basically to record his own band. And uh, we recorded uh, a whole lot of our bands. We recorded the Outcasts um, album, uh, Self-Conscious Over You. Here we recorded the experience, but we recorded uh, teenage kicks the undertones in here and uh, which basically John Cale's all-time favorite record basically uh, uh, the man who I always felt never got credit was a guy called Dave Shannon who engineered it and uh, he, Higgy lives in Canada now but when it came to pay uh, for, for, the, for the recording uh, he'd been on the phone to me and blah 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 and uh, I didn't pay him for weeks, and uh, he, he, uh, he said to me, uh, give me the bill, and I said, I'm not paying the VAT on that, uh, because we're not registered for VAT, the company, blah, 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 blah. And, and, I, and then it came, and it came one morning, and I think it was punks lying on our floor, but been on a gig the night before, sleeping on our floor, and he came down, I brought him in the kitchen, and I, I said, I refuse to pay the VAT. And he said to me, uh, because then I couldn't back down, and I wanted the tapes. And he said to me, is it a, a thing against the British government? And I said, no, it's just against them spending all, so much money on nuclear weapons. Well, Terry Hill is the kind of person that you hear, hear about him before you actually meet him. And uh, these kind of interesting people all capture a name drop in the name of this fella, and you're creating this idea in your head of this, this um, all-powerful crazy man kind of thing and then, then the first time you meet him and he's wearing his woolen jumper and stuff it's, it's a bit of an anti-climax kind of thing and then half an hour later when he, he's still on his first anecdote and he's, he's, he's ranting away about changing the world and you go okay this is an interesting fella after all so that was punk rock I was 14 15 and uh, I, I kind of sort of learned about it second hand at the start and, and he was kind of instrumental, really, in, in, in inspiring a lot of people who subsequently inspired me. Terry was the connection between John T. Davis and us. You know, he introduced John to all of us, and then John was very like Terry. He saw kind of 
a bit of a reflection of the kind of hippie time and what was going on in punk. And he really liked it, you know, and he thought, God, yeah, I want to, I want to film this as it, as it happens, you know. And uh, it was through Terry that we would meet people like John, really. It was Terry that kind of facilitated that. We'd all gone down to Cork for the weekend, for the, the, the screening of the film at the festival. And just before we left to go to Cork, and when I say we, I mean uh, two punk bands, Terry Hooley and his entourage, whoever they were at the time, and myself, and my own entourage. And very, very angry, said, fuck this, we're going to Cork anyway. Don't care if it's banned. So we all went down in the buses and so on and so forth and ended up on the streets of Cork. Uh, and we're standing there not knowing what to do, bedraggled and confused, trying to work out a plan. And Terry was standing on the corner of the street with all of us around him. And he was drinking, he was drinking you know, a can of Coke at the time, standing like this here. And there was two American tourists came up to us and put 10p into the can of coke and walked off. <laughs> I never, never forget that. He was older than a lot of the musicians and the people who were involved in the punk rock scene. And he'd seen a bit of the world. And a lot of people looked up to him. And they certainly looked up to him as a mouthpiece. You know, he, 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 it sounds an awfully corny thing to say, but he did speak for a generation. Maximum pain Never read the label Always pay the price Can He was, he was well known way. sort of character and everybody knew that he had this label and I was in a band and we, we were kind of penciled in for recording something for the Good Vibrations label which at that stage like that's the only label that anybody that was in a band wanted to record for so it was kind of quite flattering, but I mean, I, actually at that stage I found him a, a, a slightly intimidating sort of character, you know. I, I thought he was he was very upfront, very brash, and uh, I mean, you know, I heard through the grapevine that he was interested in my band, and that I would have to go down and sort of, you know, talk to the guy, and I, I was actually, I can remember being quite nervous about that. It was just just brilliant for, for me. I mean, it was just all happening. It was all happening so quick. And it, where London had been a fashionable thing and was burnt out within six months, I mean, to, to me, uh, punk has never died in Belfast. And it, but it lasted in Belfast a lot longer than it lasted a lot of other places. Loads of people have said to me since, if any town deserved punk rock, it was Belfast or it was Northern Ireland. Because there was no future and there was no... Um, it needed an alternative so much. And you were suddenly taken out of a, a very despondent situation, which was Northern Ireland, 1976-77, into this wild record shop where the racks were literally groaning under the weight of fantastic tunes and fantastic artists saying great things about what you could do with your life. And all these other young people, all in, in this building, are, are walking around outside or just posing. And, and uh, you know, it, it, it's. For a young person now, that probably sounds really pathetic, but in, in Northern Ireland at the time, it was so resonant, it really worked. One of the highlights, I think, was um, Terry decided we would go to Dublin. We had no, we, we had no gigs, we had nothing lined up, we just packed full of, full of van, us, with half a dozen of our friends and Terry, and we, and we drove down, and then these, it was the Phoenix Park Festival. And this, there, there, there had been torrential rain the, the, the day before and all the, uh, the festival gear had been, had been washed out. So they had no PA, no nothing. And we turned up in this van on a Saturday afternoon, totally on spec, and we had a, a PA with us. So Terry went up and spoke to the, to the organisers and lo and behold, we were then on the Phoenix Park, Park Festival as long as they used our PA. A crowd of about maybe five or six thousand people turned up. It was a beautiful outdoor outdoor st stadium, and Terry stayed up. And I, I don't know if you've ever heard Terry's poem "Be My Friend." 
everybody's had it. Terry done that poem. We actually counted ten separate occasions. In between every every band, Terry Terry would get up and say his poem, and we played four times. I mean, it was it was brilliant. Thanks. Good vibrations periodically returns. People almost borrow the name, or, or they encourage Terry to, to, to kind of um, to donate the, the the good vibrations label. But as a as a kind of a totally committed working entity, I think Good Vibes probably died about 1981. And uh, he didn't like someone like Tony Wilson in Manchester who set up Factory Records, and 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 evoked a whole post punk future. I think Good Vibes w was all of that three year period. It was a glorious period. The first eight records in Good Vibrations label were legendary and still are. Um, the guy burnt out basically. You know, he, he was great. He was never a great businessman and he never had a great business plan. And that's part of the glory of Terry. You know, he, he wasn't in it for the, the duration to become a mogul for the music industry. His importance was that he showed other people that you could do it yourself. The the great tragedy is that there aren't more Terry Hooleys in Northern Ireland. I think I think if there was too many of them we would all have a, have a, have a tough time <laughs> living day to day. For every person in Belfast who tries to do anything to kind of improve, uh, you know, the, the the music scene, for example, you'll get a, you'll get ten people saying he's an asshole and putting the guy down, you know, and uh, that's a peculiar thing about Belfast that. Well, maybe it's not peculiar to Belfast, but it's certainly true of Belfast. And um, there's not, you know, there's not enough people in Belfast who are prepared to actually put their ass on the line and try and do things and take a chance and maybe lose some money and be made to look silly or whatever. But you know, you need people like that there to sort of make a city like Belfast a better place. I want to say, 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 I want to in the time that I've known him, there was there always seemed to be something. There always seemed to be something which was the next happening event. He always seemed to be in there. He just cannot resist the urge to sort of put something on, and probably because he's a total egomaniac and he wants to be there and he wants to be on the stage. You know, it might <laughs> might be like three bands, but I mean, as long as he can get on the stage, and that's probably the first time I ever saw the guy was on the stage in the Hart Bar, uh, between some punk bands doing some ridiculous raffle or something like that there, but it was any opportunity to get up there, he just couldn't resist it. <laughs> well, this is uh, Belfast City Hall where some right bastards have uh, served their time as councillors representing us, the people. I always felt that none of them ever represented me. In fact, my father was the first person ever to sing the red flag inside Belfast City Hall. Yeah, my grandparents would have been here signing the covenant with, with Lord Carson. Um, I spent many hours outside here demonstrating, or uh, for good causes. Uh, we, used to, we used to have meetings here, vigils on a, on a Sunday afternoon, and I remember one time there was an orange parade walked up Royal Avenue, and there was about 50,000 orange men, and I'm standing here, uh, it's uh, a demonstrating against the war in Vietnam, and I'm holding a big Viet Cong flag. My feeling is that Northern Ireland people aren't very good at projecting themselves. The, the, it's part of the, the Belfast personality, or the Northern Ireland personality, where they don't suffer fools gladly. But the calm down of that is that people don't put themselves forward enough and don't start, don't have the confidence almost to, to, to make big interesting statements a lot of the time. And Terry Hooley is the exact opposite of that. Terry Hooley is an incredibly extravagant guy, loves talking. Half the time he doesn't exactly know what he's talking about, but he loves the sound of it. And he loves sparking off people and he loves playing the devil's advocate and saying mad things. Stuart Bailey of the, of the New Musical Express said that Good Vibrations was of the year, year period. And I think Stuart was over generous in saying that statement. We never had any money. We recorded a lot of singles that we didn't go out, go out um, at the time because we didn't have any money. And we were so, we were absolutely so naive. One day we got an order from some people in, in Italy for 500 outcast albums and we sent them to them and we never heard from them again. Did he ever like the music? I don't know. I don't, I don't even know if Terry ever liked punk, punk music. He liked the energy. In truth be told, it was the sort of violence that, 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 that sort of killed things between Terry and us then after, after a while. I mean, we, not me personally, but we run about with a rough crowd. 
and it wasn't just the, the gigs that always had violence, every single night, you were night, there was like, if, if we went to a, a party, there was trouble. So all these people would, would, would go to Terry the next day, if a house was, was wrecked, people, people called it Terry's, was, your band wrecked my house, or if there was a gig and it was wrecked, well the bill was given to Terry, plus we would do things anyway, I mean, and it reached the stage one day when Terry, I, 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 I wish I'd actually kept it, Terry gave us a letter saying that he could no longer stand it anymore and would you please leave the label and not come back. There, you know, there's always been good old Belfast cynicism, you know, it's one of the things that kind of makes us what we are, but yeah, you know, and people would have said about Terry, you know, Terry's kind of, I don't know, he's probably in his mid-thirties then, so he seemed like an old man, you know. Um, who's this guy championing all these young groups, you know, he must see pound signs in it, you know, and thinking, you know, he's just one of these guys in it for what he can get out of it. But I mean, it was absolutely untrue because, A, I don't think there was any money in it for anybody, really. And it was quite obvious that it was just born out of a real passion for, for music. And he was the only person who would do it. Other people started to kind of put local groups into studios later when they saw what happened to the undertones and thought, wow, you know, something could really happen. But nobody would do it before then. And, and Terry was the only one who would do that. And I think, you know, everyone who went through that period owes him a lot for that. He certainly made the big time in terms of uh, uh, being respected by people that know him and respected for what he has done and how he has helped people. I mean, Terry Hooley, uh, you can't think of punk rock music here without thinking of Terry Hooley. each other, whereas now in Belfast there's all sorts of pockets of, you know, even amongst the club thing, there's there's your hard house and your, your garage and all sorts of things. So it's not quite as exciting, but at the same extent it lasts longer, it's more durable because everything's so spread out and there's a, there's a whole range of, 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 of places where you can find your fun now. I have to learn to let go that the era of good vibrations is gone and get on with my life and do something else. Well, it should be sweeping the streets or picking up glasses in libraries, but just get on with my life. Neat. And everybody's 